Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, where we discuss digital transformation and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here, some of the most innovative thinkers and leaders in healthcare and technology talk about how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello again, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Sylvia Rahm, Chief Innovation Officer of the Atlantic Health System. Sylvia, thank you so much for coming on our show, and welcome. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. So let's get started. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about the Atlantic Health System and your current role for the benefit of our listeners? Absolutely. So Atlantic Health System is a health system that's in northern New Jersey. We are a mid-market-sized health system with six hospitals and four ACOs, about 4,000 physicians. And between the hospitals, we have just around 1,000 beds. So that gives you a a sense of the size of our health system. We have really visionary and strong leadership, which is actually one of the main reasons that I came here. Our um, CEO is actually one of the leaders of the American Hospital Association, and he's uh, been really great about bringing Atlantic Health System together really as a health system and thinking about ideas in a broader and more visionary way. I know that you came into your role recently, and prior to that, you were involved for several years in pioneering telehealth adoption. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and uh, maybe give us your assessment of telehealth adoption today? Yeah, absolutely. I'll sort of start a little bit back and give a little bit of my background just so your listeners understand how I think about telehealth and and what angle I'm coming from. So I'm a pediatrician by training, and I was practicing as a hospitalist when I had my second child and wanted to have a little bit more flexibility with my schedule. So I actually came into the telemedicine world as a physician looking to use telemedicine as a way to see patients and as a way to see patients from home. So that was a little over five years ago, which doesn't seem very long, but is kind of an eternity in the adoption of telemedicine. And I started with a company that was just starting up doing urgent care video visits at the time. Pretty soon after I started practicing with them, I I thought as a pediatrician and as a new mom for the second time, that new parents are the ideal target for for telemedicine. Um, You have lots of questions and it's kind of hard to leave the house. And so I started a telemedicine company for new parents with breastfeeding support that eventually started offering nutrition support as well. After getting that going, I became a subcontractor of a much larger telemedicine company called American Well. So providing those services to them, those clinical services to them, and then eventually came on to um, American Well full-time. And through American Well, started off in kind of a medical director role. So initially looking at like clinical guidelines and quality, but pretty soon thereafter, really going into more of an executive role, working with health systems to think about how to adopt digital technology. So my view changed really from a user as a physician of telemedicine technology to truly finding out how digital healthcare delivery can fit into the larger ecosystem. So when I when I think about that and we look with I look at telehealth adoption, there's a really a wide variety of adoption depending on which population you're looking at, both from the patient side and from the provider side. So from the patient side, you see most of the visits, particularly in in, in video visits, and so and and just to take another step back. I'm going to be talking about telemedicine, not meaning only live synchronous audio video connection. I I think I actually like the term digital healthcare delivery more because I think that allows people to use, think about different technologies in the same way. But I know that most people, when they talk about telemedicine, they're talking about video visits. And so I'll try to be clear when I'm talking with one or the, about one or the other, but I sometimes will use it interchangeably. 
but the vast number of, of video visits or even phone visits that are happening between patients and physicians are really urgent care style visits that are set up by health plans. The adoption by health systems of using telemedicine, again, the volume still tends to be third-party clinical providers that are providing video or telephone visits, but you're starting to slowly see health systems using telemedicine technology so their own physicians can see their own patients, but that's taking a lot longer to ramp up. Right. That's still in early stages. Now, that's an interesting background. So now you're chief innovation officer at Candic Health System. How do you define innovation and uh, what is your innovation model at Atlantic Health System? Yeah, that's, that's really a great question because innovation can be defined in, in so many different ways. So when you look at innovation roles and innovation divisions, and, and this is a new role at Atlantic Health System, and so I am defining a lot of what it means to be Chief Innovation Officer at, at Atlantic Health as we speak. When you think about uh, innovation departments or innovation shops, there are a couple of just very large buckets that you can put the shops into. One is taking internal innovation within the health system and developing it, maybe standardizing it across the health system, especially if you have a very large health system. You can have pockets of innovation and it doesn't even make it to the other sections of the health system and potentially even taking some of those ideas and commercializing them and spinning them out. Another way to think about innovation is bringing in external partners. This is often done through something like a venture arm where you are seeing the innovation that is happening in the entire ecosystem and trying to bring that innovation into your health system, one, to get the innovation that is happening explicitly with that company and with that partnership, but also to bring in some of those ideas and the mentality Maybe, for example, design thinking, which has been supported perhaps a little bit more in some of these external companies, and just bring that type of thinking within within the health system so that it, it helps you innovate as well. And this position is doing a little bit of both. Atlantic Health System has a group called Atlantic Healthcare Advancement that has been working as, a, as an innovation pipeline to bring innovative ideas from people across the health system. And it really is a wide swath of people that have been submitting ideas to the pipeline, anywhere from specific devices that then we support to prototype and look to use internally and externally, but also in thinking about care model delivery in in certain processes. Um, And it's been really great to see people get really engaged in that and, and really think about how to bring innovation into their day-to-day. We've also started building out thinking about investments and the American Hospital Association, for example, has an investment fund that we've become an an LP of and we're working with them to become an active LP and have really a reciprocal relationship where not only are they bringing in pipeline companies for us to look at, but we're also helping them understand which companies would be good for the fund to invest in by looking at the ones that really have clinical applicability within our health system. So it's definitely a give and take with learning on both sides. Um, so it's exciting that I'm, I'm really getting to build up and develop both of these areas. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, it seems like you've already covered quite a few aspects of innovation models that uh, some of the larger health systems have been at this for much longer have under their purview. And uh, in some sense, your uh, innovation function seems fairly mature, even though you are the first chief innovation officer. I'll come back to a couple of those themes uh, later on, especially around the commercialization models for internal innovation and also harnessing of external innovation. But one of the questions that uh, I get asked and I also like to ask is, how do you really prioritize your innovation ideas and your innovation pipeline in a way that it aligns with organizational priorities, even though individual initiatives may or may not be the best business cases. So how do you really do the trade-offs and how do you ensure that the right 
initiatives are getting funded and nurtured and supported? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Because (laughs) when I think of innovation in general, if you don't know where you're going with the innovation, it's like you know, you have a, a vector and you and you need a direction, you know, because if you just have the size of a vector, it could really go in any direction and you might not be moving towards where you want to be. And this is an incredibly simplistic thing that I'm I'm about to say, but I really actually do think it's important. One of my friends told me years ago that one of the schools that she went to had them ask themselves every day who am I, who do I want to become, and who am I becoming with my actions? And obviously, that's an incredibly simplistic rubric of thinking about the world, but it's it's actually so useful when you think about these very large ideas like innovation. You have to understand what your priorities are, and every time you're investing in something, you have to take that step back, even if it's just for a moment, even if it's just the beginning, but make sure you're headed in the right direction with that decision. Because there are so many shiny things out there. And there are many shiny things that get wonderful things done. But if they aren't helping you become who you want to be, if they, if they aren't helping Atlantic become the health system that it wants to be, then it's not an innovation that, that we want to invest time into. Right. I think it's really important as well, because in my role at American Well, I worked with a lot of different health systems. And it's very, very common for organizations to be pretty reactive as opposed to proactive. So when the, when they're looking for something, there's this general feeling that they need something new, that they need some innovation, and then kind of wait and see who approaches them with new ideas or new care models or new ways of doing things, and then evaluate each of those ideas on an individual basis. And what One of the things that I think is really important is to get, again, take a step back, kind of put the time and energy into understanding what your problems are and what you need solved. And then once you have a much clearer understanding about that, then proactively go out and find the people that are trying to solve those problems and work with them to solve the problems that you want, as opposed to waiting and seeing kind of who falls in your fishing net and and examining each one of those individually. The observation that you just made, our own research confirms that we see a lot of health systems that are funding and launching a lot of new innovative solutions. They are kind of standalone ad hoc initiatives. They don't really fall in line with a broad enterprise strategy. And to your point, being more proactive about what the enterprise should be looking at as opposed to you know, looking at the interesting ideas that are coming into the pipeline and then funding and implementing the ones that look promising. And there's a, an important distinction that you make there. Switching topics a little bit, uh, you mentioned digital a little earlier on when you, when you talked about telehealth. And digital transformation is in early stages for healthcare. At the same time, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of effort that is going into helping healthcare enterprises get ready for the future. And we all agree that healthcare is illiterate behind other sectors, such as retail or banking or hospitality, for instance. So when we talk to, in our research and in our work with health systems, we hear about digital transformation being all about reimagining patient and caregiver experiences. Do you agree with that definition, first of all? And then Can you maybe share an example or or two of innovation initiatives that really align with the digital transformation of the enterprise at Atlantic Health System? Yeah, no, that's a that's a a really great question as well. So again, this I'm going to be pulling a little bit more on my previous role to answer this than, than on my current one, since I'm just a few months in at Atlantic. But understanding that digital transformation is not simply automating or digitizing all of the current workflows is really important because if all you think about for telemedicine, for example, is that you are replacing the in-person visit one-to-one with a video visit, for example, then you're not going to fully understand all of the benefits that comes from having a digital transformation. And the way that I think about it, and that often resonates with health system leadership in particular, 
is around value-based care. And, and so if you think of value-based care as simply a different way to pay for the same interactions that everybody is, was already having in the fee-for-service world, then you're never going to create good value-based care because a lot of the way that we practice medicine, that we deliver care, has been shaped by the, the fee-for-service interaction. And it's actually not best for the patient or, or for the caregiver. And the same is true for geography and the activation energy of coming in for a physical visit. A lot of what we do is based upon the idea that that is difficult both for the caregiver and, and for the patient. And so when you remove that, it doesn't make sense to just keep everything else the, the same. And, and one of the examples that I use for this, and again, coming from my pediatric background, when you look at school-based medicine, for example, or school-based telemedicine programs, when schools are initially thinking about this, it's often because they don't have enough money to pay for nurses, and so they have a shortage. And so they initially think, oh, we can bring nurses in to replace the nurse that we have. And that obviously has some benefits. But you know, then you start to think, oh, well, instead of a nurse, maybe we could have a physician at this point because of the economies of scale and the efficiency that comes with telemedicine, we can actually afford to have a physician that could maybe order and prescribe medication so that it just gives the, the office more flexibility. And then once you start thinking of, about that, you can start to think about things like, well, maybe the kid with ADHD that needs to see, go in and see their psychiatrist every month, well, one, maybe this kid shouldn't be missing a day of school because they're already having problems and you can have the psychiatrist come into the school. And then if you're not missing school, maybe really the kid should be seen for 10 minutes or five minutes once or twice a week instead of for a longer period of time once a month and that you're actually getting better clinical care when you do it that way. And again, that's just one example of many, but, but you know, I think of that as the evolution of understanding how, how digital technology can actually provide better care in circumstances, but, but really needs to be thought of differently than just replacing what you're doing one-on-one. -on -one. You mentioned value-based care, and I want to touch on that a little bit. Now, we all know that the shift from fee-for-service to value-based care is not happening as quickly as many of us would uh, like to see. At the same time, the investment in digital technologies, uh, which essentially assumes a capitated model of payment, has to be justified in some way. Part of it is justified through strategic needs. So telehealth, for instance, you know, you have to have a telehealth program because that is the way of the future. Whether or not you're making money today, you still have to invest in it. And I see, and the sense I get is that a lot of health systems are making some of these investments to digitally transform themselves to reimagine their patient experience or their caregiver experience in anticipation of the day when you know, you're going to be in a capitated model and in a value-based care environment. Given that, what is your sense, and since you've come from the outside and you're relatively new to looking at it from the inside of a health system, what is your sense of where health systems are today in their journey towards uh, digitally transforming themselves? Yeah, that's <laughs> it's very interesting because I think that what you said right there is so crucial to understand about, everybody said, talks about a foot and two canoes, like trying to head towards value-based care, but that being in direct competition with the fee-for-service model. And the health systems that I have seen really move forward in the digital transformation. And, and you've actually probably seen this even more than, than I have in, in your role. And so you, you can say your thoughts as well. But are the ones that recognize that healthcare has to have this digital transformation and that it's been a slow start, but before we know it, it's going to be here. And so we might not be able to justify it. And in fact, it'll probably eat into the fee-for-service revenue for the time being, but, but we have to do it. Otherwise, there will be disruptors that will do it for us. And so when I think of it in the retail world, I think of, gosh, how hard must it have been to be on the leadership of some of these large retail store chains where having e-commerce as part of their model didn't exist. And, you know, and for a while there, there was this divide that you kind of see in healthcare right now 
of all the old stores, all the old bricks and mortar stores. And then you have the e-commerce disruptors and there wasn't great integration between them. And so there wasn't a good model of, someone called it the other day and I, I loved it, clicks and mortar, which I think is great, which some of these stores have adopted where, you know, for example, you order the items that you want online and then you have a special spot in the store where they get picked up. So it's, a, it's kind of a combination of, of e-commerce and the traditional retail. But a few years ago, that didn't, model didn't exist, right? Like someone had to create that model. And so, so you're the leadership of this big store. You see these e-commerce shops opening up and they're gaining market. But remember, they still don't have a ton of market. You just see them coming and you have to make the decision. Do we change our entire model to try to compete with them? Or do we stay where we are and hope that something comes up between now and then that saves us? And you see large you know, store chains, you could see making both decisions. And at the time, you know, I think that it was not an unreasonable business decision to say, you know what, this is our model. We're good at it. We're going to keep it. We're going to sit and wait and see what happens. But in the end, we know what happens. Lots of these um, retail stores close. And the only ones that are surviving are the ones that either have a completely different demographic or are incorporating e-commerce into how they work. And it's, it's a hard decision, but I think the same thing is coming in healthcare. There are many, many, many health systems where I get the feeling that the leadership is like, ah, can we just hold out a few more years until I retire? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're not going to have to deal with it. Yeah, I hear this uh, uh, being described as the two canoe model. You have a leg in two canoes and you're hoping that you're going to be able to sail downstream without losing balance, right? And, and what you're describing as a kicks and mortar, I think that's what they're referring to as the two canoe model here. That's fascinating. So as a chief innovation officer, you necessarily have to deal with uh, a lot of the risks that come with innovation. You are harnessing internal and external innovation. And by definition, many of these ideas will never come to fruition. Some will consume resources and fail, and a small number will make it. We all know that the digital health startup ecosystem is being fueled by billions and billions in venture capital money, but they have a high mortality rate for reasons not connected to the health system themselves, but for their own business reasons or whatever it is. So as the chief innovation officer, the risk becomes a very big part of your life. You know, How do you look at this and... Uh, What do you think health systems need to be doing in terms of either changing their mindset to embracing these kinds of risks, and at the same time, also facilitating a pathway to success for the more promising ideas? I know it's a two-part question there, but hopefully that was clear. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. So having worked in the digital health world now for a few years, so starting off as a physician, working clinically in a health system and then moving to the digital health world for a few years and now coming back to the health system space, it's been very interesting to see how different parties view the relationship between health systems and companies. And I actually posted something in LinkedIn, gosh, probably a week ago that has gotten such a tremendous response saying that I am retiring the word pilot and vendor (laughs) in my health system. And I'm replacing pilot with phase one, which Mm -hmm. is you have, you start something with a company that has a defined outcome that you're looking for. And if you make that outcome, there's a trigger that moves on to phase two automatically, which is some sort of scaling. And if you don't hit that outcome, then you stop. But it's this death by pilot uh, phenomenon that I think that you hear a lot about in the digital health world that I'm really trying to tackle with that question and, and just the ideas behind it. And the other one is the word vendor, which I think it's supposed to be neutral, but I actually find it has implications around it that there is a almost a master servant relationship with that the the company that you're working with is there just to to serve the needs you're you're the vendor and having worked in a lot or in one of these companies and you've worked with a lot of other companies 
they're just really, really smart people, obviously on both sides, but also in the companies that are working on these problems that have a lot of knowledge of the area that they are working in. And I found this, again, being on the tech company side, I got to see these technologies being implemented in dozens of health systems. And so I often had a very good view of the nuts and bolts of, of how this worked. But I found it amazing how often I would offer to health system leadership to help them think about implementation strategy and how many of the leadership teams wouldn't take me up on that offer. And now that I'm on the health system side a little bit more, I do think it's this concept of like, oh, they're the vendor that puts that barrier there because it makes it seem like this isn't a back and forth relationship where we're learning from one another. And I think that those types of relationships are really important, one, to solve big problems because almost always you're trying to solve something complicated in healthcare. It's very rarely, it's very rare that you're trying to solve simple problems. And so getting smart people with different experiences in the room working together is really important to get answers for this. But it's also, you know, as you said, there's a high mortality rate on the startup side. And so is as a health system, part of the way that we can be a good partner, it's not just, you know, offering a space for, for people to implement, but really, you know, giving that product and design feedback and helping them understand the complexity and value drivers of being in the health system and bring that tons of information that comes from having worked in such a complex environment to the company so that they get better. And in doing that, in fact, if you can implement in two health systems, that puts you way ahead of the curve for most companies and in the ability to scale and thrive. Yeah, yeah. As someone who uh, runs an advisory firm, I can't tell you how much I appreciate just the thought that you want to replace the word vendor with something that suggests much more of a collaborative mindset. And I applaud you for that. And I wish uh, the spirit behind that thought is something that spreads more because I think at the end of the day, digital transformation is not going to be accomplished by any any health system in a vacuum. This is going to be a set of collaborative partnerships where which are mutually reinforcing and uh, where there are win-win outcomes. And for that to happen, words matter. And, and I, once again, I applaud you for that. So coming up to the end of our time here, and uh, I just wanted to ask you one question. Ultimately, as Chief Innovation Officer, you are going to be tasked with uh, certain goals and uh, demonstrating certain results. How do you define and measure success, or how do you propose to define and measure success for the innovation function at Atlantic Health System? How do you look at it? (laughs) Yeah, another really good question. So again, I am still just a few months into this position, and really these first few months, um, we're understanding these important meta questions that we were talking about earlier in our conversation. What are our strategic goals? Where are we headed? What do we have right now? And that's the other thing in being in a, in a health system of the size of Atlantic. As you said, there's already a significant amount of innovation that exists and is developed. And so how do I bring that together Where are we seeing the innovation? Who are the people that are taking the lead? I'm still doing a lot of the groundwork assessment of what we have and generally where we want to go. And then once I'm able to do that, then I'll be able to look more closely at what success metrics are. In general, we talk about operations improvement and creating an innovative culture and environment, retaining our most innovative clinicians and and staff. And so all of those are going to be a portion of of what we look at, but we're still, I'm still creating the larger goals and then we'll have to break that down into the success metrics as well. Right. And I hope to have you back as a guest, uh, maybe a year or so from now when you can maybe talk to some of the successes and how you were able to go about that process. I really look forward to that. So, I think you've provided some very, very interesting perspectives by virtue of your uh, having come from 
you know, technology provider organization and given your background as a pediatrician. So it's, it's going to be very interesting times ahead for you. And, and I wish you all the best in your new role. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll look forward to talking to you again in a year or so as well and compare notes with what we said here. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, once again, uh, thank you, Sylvia, for uh, joining us. And uh, I appreciate your uh, thoughts and appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. All the very best, and I look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info at thebigunlock.com.